Hello and welcome to Muse Jam Session Recording 187. My name is Danny Beaumont and I'm a product manager on the Adobe Muse team. In today's session, we're going to focus on all things typography. Um, to give a little bit of context, I won't talk long here, vaguely, but um, typography is really interesting to me. I've always loved typesetting and fonts. It was my first love when I started working for Adobe a very long time ago. And it, it really, I think, bears merit to put a little context. Um, the majority of the team early on when they built Adobe Muse, um, that team came from InDesign. There were a, a number of seasoned developers that had developed the InDesign application. Adobe acquired Aldis like 25 years ago and had Aldis PageMaker and replaced it with InDesign, which um, has probably the most extraordinary typesetting controls, I think, for desktop publishing for print um, today. There are wonderful, wonderful attributes around typography that you can access in InDesign and things that you can do in print that are just amazing. The team that works on Muse has all of that knowledge. The developers that work on Muse worked on that InDesign integration or uh, development back in the day, but there's a huge difference around what we can do with typography on the web as compared to what we did it with print. So in the world of print, Adobe established something called PostScript, and we established something called InDesign. And the two together allowed us to define controls in an application that using a language known as PostScript, we could talk to laser printers, high-speed black and white printing presses, all sorts of things like that. And it was a really nice tight loop, so we could develop and control all aspects of that workflow. When it comes to the web, Muse is a very similar tool to InDesign. It allows you to visually design for the web, but you're unable really to uh, come in and have as much control over what you're designing typographically because you're reliant on web standards. We hear this, but HTML5, CSS3, um, those are standards that web things like web browsers, different devices, um, operating systems rely on to make sure that the website you're designing looks the same wherever you go. It's an open standard. So that means we may suggest a fantastic feature, um, for example, being able to stroke fonts so that you have a stroke and a fill on a typeface. The Muse team, when considering such a feature, has to look and assure that that capability is going to work across all sorts of browsers, both old and new. We try to have retro compatibility to Internet Explorer, for example, and make sure that what you're designing will be consistent across all of the devices that are going to view that site. So as such, our hands are a little bit more tied. We don't have as much typographic control. Adobe acquired a company called Typekit probably about five years ago, four years ago, and Typekit has an extraordinary foundry of thousands of typefaces. Those typefaces have been optimized for the web, um, but even in that world, things like open type ligatures, um, FI ligatures, for example, being able to flow text between columns, those are all experimental things that some browsers, some developers will take advantage of, let's say as a hand coder, but they're not something you can rely on that works across all of the browsers. Typekit does, and Typekit fonts work beautifully in Muse and on many browsers, but some of the more advanced controls, um, you really have to stop and consider um, in light of web browsers and standards. So I guess with that as a caveat, let's go ahead and start to look at this design. So this is good old Ike's Bikes. I haven't opened up this site in a long time, and I'm happy to actually be back here. Ike's Bikes was uh, an example we used to show things like typography, um, we also showed scroll effects, so this parallax scrolling effect that allows you to have, it looks a little jumpy with my screen sharing here, but allows you to have that background scroll of images giving you a parallax effect is um, one of the features that we showcase in this asset and that Adobe News supported. We evolved in the last year to support responsive design, and then after that, the integration of both responsive design and scroll effects together. So I'm working with a designer right now to refresh this design um, in a new look and feel for good old Ike um, that integrates responsive design scroll effects um, together in one place. 
So stay tuned. That new work is coming along in the next few months. And in the meantime, we're going to kind of go back in time and look at this site. This is a static web design. It does not have responsive. It has alternate layout. So there's a phone layout, a tablet. I don't think we did a tablet layout, in fact. Um, desktop and phone. And they're both available. But this is not a responsive design. From a typographic standpoint, it's okay. Everything we're going to talk about does apply to responsive designs, and I'm going to show you a few new features around typography and responsive design as we go along. But some of the capabilities I'm going to show you today, let's kind of review it and then I'll jump on in. We have things like um, caps here. I've got uh, the ability to set very large text at the beginning of a paragraph. I can flow this text around the large um, titling cap here that I have. I can also come in, let's see, and flow text around images. I can show you that. I don't think we have a visual example here on this design. Here on the services page, I can do things like um, superscript and subscript. So notice if I zoom in a little bit on this area, I've got the numbers a little smaller here. That's known as a, a superscript. Um, you can also do things like footnotes. Um, and define a footnote at the bottom of a pair, uh, sentence, let's say, and that ability to set that font very small is supported within Muse. So we've got the word second and third here, that's using the superscript capability. I can also change the case of blocks of text to be all capitals, all lowercase. I believe we can even do titling case, which is the first letter of each word is capitalized. I gotta double check on that. Um, we also support things like numbered lists and bullets lists. Um, when defining a numbered list, um, you can come in and set that numbering sequence. For the world of bulleting lists, you can use a bullet that might be associated with a particular typeface. If you don't like the bullets built into a font, I'll show you how we can come in and select bullets from a totally different typeface, or even create custom icon font that you then can use as bullets throughout your site. So we're going to look at that bit. And uh, as I mentioned, we'll jump over into responsive a little bit. All right, that's what I did on Facebook Live. So much better the second time. You should have heard it the first time, had the volume been turned up. Okay, um, let's get serious, though, and start going through our list, because I have a lot to cover today. Um, so first off, there is that URL. So if you are following along, if you're looking at the YouTube recording, if you point your browser to tinyurl.com forward slash moojam dash type, um, chances are in the comments below this session, I'll also include that link. So uh, check down there. <laughs> check down there. Isn't that what they always do on YouTube videos? Down below um, in the comments. All right. Um, Let's dig in. I'm going to do a balance of showing things in Ikes and just starting from scratch. I think it helps to see things from nothing. So if I say File New and I want to work, um, I'm going to be lazy as usual without cheating. So I want to come on in and grab some text. I'm going to go to this live site and I'm just going to steal some text to be real quick about it. Let's go ahead and get my browser back at its normal actual size. And let's say I wanted to grab a little bit of text here. I'm just going to copy it. This is just uh, lazy man typing, basically. So I'll copy that. Let me come in and use and paste it. So it's very unformatted, just very basic type. Let's see if I could be extra lazy and I'll grab bikes and beans. And I'm going to allow that to be a headline. Now, sort of type 101, you may already know this um, through the years, more experienced type designers using Muse have figured it out. But the difference between uh, web safe fonts, web fonts, desktop fonts, the naming's all a bit confusing, um, and I think there's some merit to explaining it a bit. So through the years of desktop publishing, there was something known as system fonts or web safe fonts. And web safe fonts were thought to be typefaces that if you selected them, they would look the same and be available in every browser and every device. Um, I think we don't even call them web safe because there's not very much that's safe about it. Um, they are very inconsistent across many, many platforms, but there's usually at least a font or a fallback font, as it's known, that you can somewhat rely on. So let's say I went to this first block of text um, and I wanted to set the font here. 
I can type T on the keyboard to switch to that type tool. And my control strip here at the top changes to have specific uh, typographic controls. Notice in the text drop down area, I have some buckets. I have recently used fonts. So if you've been using Muse for a while, you're going to see the most recent, I think, perhaps 10 fonts in that list. Then we have what's known as web fonts, standard fonts with fallbacks. This is what I was just talking about. And then system fonts. Standard fonts, notice that they're here. As I mentioned, they're not um, all that standard. They'll look a little different from device to device. But, and they also have something known as fallbacks, which says that if you go to a machine that perhaps doesn't have Comic Sans, um, I'm sure not sure what MS is there, um, but it will fall back to MS. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Comic Sans. Let's try an easier one. Georgia. So if I go to a machine that has Georgia built in, if it's accessible in the system and the browser can reflect it, whatever I typeset with Georgia will work, native running on that machine. If they don't have Georgia, the next fallback, so the next thing it's going to fall over to is Palatino. After that, you'll have Palatino Linotype. And I can't really see it with the ellipsis is here, but when I roll over, if it doesn't have Palatino, doesn't have Palatino Linotype, it's going to fall back to Times, Times New Rome, Roman, or basically any damn serif font that happens to be loaded in the system. So that's what a fallback is about. If you look on your machine, you have Lucida Grand, it'll fall back to the Unicode instance, and then any sans serif font that happens to be on the machine. So A, these are pretty unattractive fonts by today's standards. Some of them can be retro cool, but they're mostly not. Um, B, you can't totally trust and rely that what you see there is going to be what's selected. But let's go ahead and um, select Georgia, and we're going to go ahead and call this fallback. Or uh, so, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting my words here today. Let's see, they're called standard fonts, so I'm going to use that word. Kind of another world, let's say you have a client, and the client is very precious about a particular typeface, and they use that typeface as their brand. And it's a typeface that's available for print. They used it in brochures, um, typesetting through the years, and they want to use it on the web. Those fonts are known as system fonts. Um, let's come on in and select this block of text, type T on the keyboard, and we'll go on down to the system fonts. Notice that it says export as image. That's really important to point out. So anything that I've installed in my system is going to be resident, is going to be available to me in this list. But any font that I choose here is a little dangerous um, in that it's going to be rendered as an image. So let's say I'll come on in and pick something a little interesting. Let's say I want Bodoni Old Style. So I'll come in and select that font. And I'll go ahead and choose uh, the bold weight, feeling a little bold and brash. Notice on my design canvas, I get this pesky little icon that's indicating that the text that I've just selected is going to be rendered as an image. That's important to understand. Um, you can get rid of that if that annoys you. If you go into preferences, you can ask, ask, ask. You can ask that Muse not show you this icon in every block of text that is rendering in this way, but it's a really nice reminder and indicator that what you've just done is selected text that's not um, available for the web, and it will be rendered as an image or a bitmap. We'll take a look at that in a second, um, but let's grab the next chunk here and select in the text dropdown. Um, we'll go with web fonts. So in the world of web fonts, you'll notice that I've got some things going on here. I've gone in and added some web fonts, and I've added them both from the Adobe Typekit library and also uh, what we call web fonts here or Google web fonts or Edge web fonts. It's basically an open standard set of free fonts. If you ever Google Google web fonts, um, those fonts are available to you. They're open, they're free, you don't have to license anything from Adobe. We support them as well. And I've got a number of them that I've added in the past, and I'll show you how we add them in just a second. But I can come on in and select a font, let's say Freight Macro Pro, and I'll go in and again, choose a bit of a heavy weight. We'll go with medium and apply that. Now without doing much more, let's kind of go on in and take a look at what I've done here. So I'm gonna pull that on file, 
to preview the page in the browser. News makes it very easy for you to at least understand the code that is being generated um, by looking at it in the browser uh, and to see the effect of the design work you've done. Now I'm coming in, let's go in and start at actual size. So this is 100% actual size in the browser. And the fonts that I've set look pretty good. At actual size though, I'm seeing that this middle bucket, it's looking kind of fuzzy to me. If I come on in and zoom in a little bit, so if I zoom in or hit Command Plus to zoom in more tightly and really exaggerate these fonts, you can start to see um, more of what's going on with the typeface. So the standard font, I can come in and select it. Notice as I press and drag here, this is a web font, but it's not that attractive um, and it's kind of old. Um, it's very limited in my options as far as what the design would be. On the right, I have that type kit font that I've selected. I can select it. And as I get in really tight and really exaggerate this, what you'll notice is I'm able to zoom in on my text here and see that it is remaining very clean and crisp. The middle text is the one I used my system font for, and it's a resolution dependent font. So it was, it's like an image, it's like a photograph. When I zoom in on it, it gets a little bit more um, fuzzy. I can come in and instead of selecting it, I can kind of press and drag. I can even right click here and say, uh, open image in a new tab. And in that new tab, I see that news is rendered. It's actually, it's actually a graphic or an image. Now, the good news about our automatic image generation there is that if I come in, and let's say I had to do this, my client made me do it, um, and I went back into Muse, and instead of bikes and beans, I said something like, um, my favorite client. And... Uh, so let's go ahead and look at the code that's generated there. Um, actually, I'm gonna make life simple. I'm gonna turn off these two guys, this and this. I'll be a little lazy. Ugh. Jeepers creepers, come on. Easy select, I'm gonna go ahead and hide it. And just have the text that we see here. Preview in the browser. There's that word, my favorite client. Now I've already explained that this is rendering as a bitmap or an image. The good news is that Muse does understand that we need to flatten it in order to preserve the typeface you're rendering. But if I right click and go ahead and view the page source, a uh, <laughs> little zoomed in, are we? Um, in that source text, we know that we named it my favorite client, right? Is that what we did? My favorite client. And if I come back and look at the code for a moment, and just search for client. What you'll see is we come on in and create an image, and I can see the image is referenced in the code, but we also render something known as alt tags or alternate text. This allows screen readers for people that are visually impaired to know what that image says. It also allows search engines to come in and optimize or search the content for SEO optimization and find the words, my favorite client. So if I happen to type the name of my favorite client using a system font, I can rest assured that I won't be penalized from an SEO standpoint. It's a name that appears in the HTML so that it can be searched and it can be supported by screen readers even though it's being rendered as an image. All right, as usual, I need to speed up, believe it or not, because we got a lot to cover. Um, as you work, we'll talk a little bit more about these different font types. Um, let me show you how you can actually add those typefaces into the work you're doing. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring back my other blocks of very lovely text here. And um, let's say I wanna work with yet another typeface. I wanna come on in and search around a bit to see what I've got available to me. So if I pull down, let's see, I'll go to this terrible standard font, select it, type T on the keyboard, and this time when I pull down on the menu, I'm gonna go into the uh, web font area, but I'm gonna click on the add web fonts. This allows me to come in and as you saw, choose from the Typekit library, that edge web font of Google web fonts that are available. And then I also can select from self-hosted fonts. Now to a large extent when it comes to the web, there are thousands of fonts. And if you're a true typographer, you never can have enough fonts. It's like something you hoard. Um, I personally find that to some extent, because we're talking about the web, lots of special things like 
old style characters, open type support, special kerning pairs, things of that sort, really you can't take advantage of on the web, as I mentioned earlier on. So knowing that um, you have a little bit of a lesser range for design, you can come in and shop for Typekit fonts, and the few thousand that are available there, I think really give you a broad set of options for your design. As you're shopping for fonts, um, you can come in into this panel and look. Let's say you're not sure about what you'd like. I can come in and filter here, and I can select, you know, I'm a big fan of slab fonts, and I might want it for body text. So as I'm selecting these filters, it's subsetting the choices that I have available to me. I can also decide if I, let's say I want it to be um, a condensed width font. And lastly, I'll push my luck, because you'll notice I'm down to one font. Um, so I may have narrowed my choices too far. I also like old style characters. Looks like I've actually found the one typeface <laughs> that meets all that criteria. So it's got old style characters, it's compressed, it's good for uh, paragraphs, and it's a slab font. All right, now that I've narrowed down my choice, I can come on in and you'll notice this font has a family of typefaces. There are 14 weights available for the typeface. I can get another look at it and make sure that I like what it looks like. And I'll go ahead and click OK. And that's now selected and will be added to my design. Now, for the life of me, I kind of already forgot the name of that. So let's go back in and see what we just added, because I'm a bit of a skeptic. So I'm going to add web fonts, type kit. I'm going to do that one more time. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. So this is Adele Condensed. And um, I'll go ahead and click OK. And I can now come to the list here. Looks like I've got a lot of fonts, and where Adele is, I'm not really sure. So I can just type AD, which is going to sift through everything I have on my system and allow me to select Adele Condensed. And I can come on in now and choose a bit of a beefy um, weight. We'll go with semi-bold and select that. So I've now gone in and done that. Um, let's keep going on our list because I don't want to miss too much here. That is how to select font types. Next on the list is styling. So one of the things I'm a big fan of as you're working, I, I just finished redoing uh, that good old rowing website over two and a half weeks. And it reminded me about, I guess, there's best practices and then there's when you're really working under the gun. Some things that are good to invest in from a time standpoint that are really advantageous to you and some things that you just don't have time to deal with. Um, so I think I have a realistic sense of that fresh in my mind. One thing that is invaluable is setting up styles for graphics, characters, paragraph styles, um, and swatches. If you set those up right as you build out a site, it's so easy as you evolve across many pages to go back and make changes. So let's say I've finally decided that Adele is the typeface I really want to use on my site. What I want to do is come on in and set a couple things around styles. I'm going to use, move myself out of the way, which you all don't really, you can move me out. <laughs> earlier on. Uh, I'm going to come on in and do a couple things. Let's say that, um, all right, we're going to stay away from color swatches. I can come in and name and control my color swatch sets in this panel. This is another style that I can define. From a typographic standpoint, though, let's say I think this looks pretty terrific. I can come in and set certain type attributes. So these are the type controls that we support and use that are also supported on the web. You can pretty much rest assured that that'll work well for you. So if I come in and choose a nice kind of muddy green color here, let's make it a little more vibrant. It's looking a little, mm, um, let's go purple, feels better. So I can set a color. Um, I can set the point size I'd like to work with. Um, these days, tracked out font seems to be quite a trend. So maybe I track it out to about uh, four for the tracking value. And the other thing I can do is control the case. I can have it be all lower case, um, titling case. Remember we talked about that. Uh, let's turn that off. Um, or all caps. Not titling case. I'm sorry. Superscript and subscript. So this is superscript, subscript, and all caps would be my titling case. 
So perhaps I think that's an attractive version. Let's go and let it out just a little bit more. Or I'm sorry, track it out a little bit more. Additionally, as I'm working, I can come in and set other attributes. Maybe I want to make sure that every headline has uh, 20 points above it, just for a spacing standpoint, and maybe 10 points below it. I can set all of these attributes. So now it's really easy to line these two text boxes up to one another and have consistent spacing. Um, if I really like what I've done here, and I've set all these attributes, I can do a couple other things. Um, if I go over to paragraph styles, I'm going to come on in and create a paragraph style. So I'll select that headline. Let's go in and do the body text as well a little bit. So I'll go into the body text, and these days about 160 points supposedly is a good uh, tracking. I'm sorry, my typographic terms today is good letting. So letting is like lead that used to be lines between typeset text. So I'm setting my letting um, to be about 160%. Uh, I could also, let's see, decide how I want it to align. Um, let's go ahead and set it to 16 points, which is also considered a good web point size. Uh, now that I have that pretty well set, I may want to use this across the site. So what I can do is go into that paragraph style area. I'm going to select that headline, and I'm going to click the Add button, and I'll go ahead and give it a name. I'm going to call it um, subhead. I can come in now and control uh, P tags or H1 tags. I'm going to set this as a subhead H2. This is where you set the hierarchy of importance for the text on your site so that when a search engine crawls it, they know what's most important. Chances are the name of the page um, is going to be the most important thing, and that'll be my H1 on that page. H2 subhead may be different categories. Um, I can come in and set P tags as well, but this is important from a search engine optimization standpoint. I'll go ahead and call that subhead and click OK. I'm going to come into my body text, and I'll go ahead and change the color of that real quick so it's not quite so black. Select that guy, come on in here. Let's just make it a bit of a more gentle gray. So once I get that where I like it, I'll come back into the paragraph styles, and I'm going to create a new style, and I'll call it body. And I'm going to stick with the P tag or paragraph tag. So now that I've done that, it was a lot of work, right? I can easily come into each of these and say, I want you to be a subhead, and I want you to be body text. And maybe I want to select all of these guys. Let's see if I'm lucky here. I'm going to select the group. And you'll notice when you select a group, instead of selecting an individual handle for a container, you can resize all the containers by pressing and dragging. And using control keys like an option key, you can control the space between these objects. Helps if they're consistent to start with. And grow those containers appropriately. So I'll kind of do this a little bit make them a little bigger, and you know, lastly, in the spirit of laziness, I can go to my align panel and just distribute the spaces, whoops, <laughs> not that way. Um, let's do this a little bit. So um, it's kind of interesting that this guy's breaking so early. Let's try to take a look at that. You're not doing that. Okay, let's grow this whole thing a little bit more. Give ourselves a little more space. And I'll bring this guy out a little bit further. Add an extra space there in bikes and beans because as we know, I copied it from the web. <sighs> get these guys a little happier. And I can always, as I'm dragging here, get consistent spacing through that method. And get these guys, make sure they're all lined up, and move them down a bit. All right, looking a little bit better. This guy I did not change, so I'm going to come on in now with that body text, select these other two items, and in paragraph styles, set that to be a uh, body style. Let's try this. Hmm. You look like you're ignoring me. Body. Adele condensed. 
Very interesting. I think this one's still believing it's something different than it is. I'm not sure why I'm getting that. Let's try this. I'll select all, make sure I set it to none, switch over to body text. Kind of a mystery. Um, this is no longer going to be rendered as an image. So I don't know why it's being cranky. I'm going to be lazy and just do this. Okay, so I now have some blocks of text that I can work with. And I've gone in and created the styles. Let's say for some reason you decided that you want to make sure that certain text when it's highlighted gets extra emphasis. So I might decide that Katie um, of good old Katie's Cafe needs extra emphasis. So I'll come in and I might want to use Adele Condensed and I'm going to go with um, bold. I want it to be really bold and just to be a little crazy because it's my good friend Katie. We'll pick a bit of an intense orange shade. So I can come in and set certain attributes. This is um, something that I want to apply to individual words within a paragraph, but not the entire paragraph. So I've gone in and made changes to the body text. And notice that it's indicating when I roll over here that certain attributes have been set, letting, size, font, P tags, and the color. Um, the actual typeface and the color, those are changes I've made to that base style. The magic of Adobe Muse, and I kind of want to emphasize this, emphasize this, is let's say I decided the body text should be an entirely different typeface. If I come in and redefine a style, it's going to redefine all of the attributes above that dotted line to be the new style, but it magically always retains or remembers any of the variants that I've done below that dotted line, which is really great. So if I changed, um, let's say, a point size or um, tracking on a particular typeface, I can go ahead and retain those overrides even when I change a paragraph style. Might have had too much coffee today and not enough lunch, so <laughs> y'all are welcome to let me know later on if I'm making no sense. I've gone in, though, and I've set this unique font that I'd like to use. For that, I'm going to come into something known as character styles and create a character style. And I'll call it uh, emphasis. And I'll click OK. What I can do then is if I want to emphasize, these are not links, these are just typographic emphasis. I can come in and select the words that I want to emphasize. You'll notice it's still using the overall paragraph style. I can see that here. It's the body style, but I've got overrides that are there. So that's the difference between character and paragra paragraph styles. You really want to use paragraph styles for full blocks of text and not the character style. Kind of an important difference. All right. Let's see where we're going. So we got to styling a little bit. Uh, character and paragraph. Graphic styles will do other things for you. So um, <laughs> you ready for something painful? Uh, I can come on into my headline here. Let's just do it to one. And I may decide that I want to apply a shadow to my text. Now, everybody knows that flat, tracked out design is hot, and shadows are not. But traditionally, when Muse actually applied a shadow to text, it had to flatten it as an image. But at some time this year, um, we went in and converted that shadow to a CSS style which means we're using CSS code, which means it's a very light, we don't have to render images any longer, we can just define it in CSS. So it's kind of cool. Um, let's do a couple things. I'm going to make this bigger so we can see what I'm about to do. And let's go into effects. And I'm going to actually select the shadow. Wow, see how pretty that is? Um, maybe I'll go ahead and riff off the color a little bit so it's not quite so dramatic. So I'm going to steal, kind of lazy man, that purple. And I'm going to darken it up for sure because I want it to be a shadow. And uh, I might set it to not be blurry because that's a little more trendy if I flatten it out. Say blur of zero, angle of 45, and distance of about five. Let's just see. Eh, it's still a little noisy. I'm going to bring it in pretty tight. So I get that not so awful shadow that I've defined. If I would like to use that shadow, um, I'm going to do a couple things. I'll come in and change my subhead. Notice that as you roll over here, my paragraph style has changed in the point size. Remember, I made it bigger. So I'm going to go ahead and absolve that in, absorb that into the style. 
the way I do it is to right click on this item and instead of clearing the override which would make the point size go back to the style that's been saved I'm going to redefine the overall style now get ready because the two other columns should change appropriately there you go they now have changed that point size but the shadow didn't carry over in order to make the shadow happen I need to come to graphic styles and go ahead and change or create yet another style. So this one's going to be shadow me. And I'll click OK. And I'm going to come into these two text boxes and I'm going to set that shadow as well. All right. Um, again, not high fashion, but I'm sure we will all survive as we show this off. I'm going to align the bottoms a little bit. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, those are great, Danny, but think about all those styles I've got to worry about. I've got a graphic style, paragraph style, sometimes I've got a character style, and I have a swatches style. Is there any way to roll those all together? Because uh, I not only need to keep those straight, but I need to also worry about states, up, over, down, and active states. The answer is no, but I agree with you. <laughs> um, you have to set these manually, and it's powerful to be able to define it and propagate your site. But one thing you want to keep in mind is as you're working, let's say I'm here and, you know, just to be funny, I'm going to come through to these guys and I'm going to go to my text frame and I'm going to keep it in the normal state, which is the up state of that text. I'm going to go back to my graphic styles and I'm going to set it to none. So I don't want to have that classy shadow um, applied. I'll go to the next uh, state, the rollover state, and I'm going to say, yeah, go ahead, shadow me. Let's apply the shadow. Notice I'm in the rollover state here. And if I were to bring the states panel out, it's a little easier to see what I'm doing. So in the normal state, I don't have that terrible shadow. In the rollover state, I do. The mouse down state, I do. And then active state, it's going to go back to not being there. So I am welcome to apply graphic, character, text, Paragraph, basically, I'm sorry. I am welcome to apply a swatch color, um, a paragraph style, or a graphic style on a per state basis um, if I want to. So just to kind of summarize that up a little bit, if I come on into the browser and take a look at what I've got, we've got standard fonts, my favorite client, Bikes and Beans, and when I roll over any of these text fields, notice I get that beautiful shadow applied. But wait, we got lots to cover and not much time. I may go long today, which means y'all can leave if you want to, but I might keep talking. Okay, icon font approaches. There are a couple different ways you can work with icon fonts, and some of these have had to do with, as Muse has evolved our capabilities, and it also really has to do with what your goals are. One way to work with an icon in your site is to just go on in and place uh, a graphic. So let's go in and show this a bit. So we're going to go in and just say file place. Not sure what I'm going to grab here, but let's see. If I go to my Dropbox and I'm going to try ICO. So I've saved lots of icons here in my directory. Should get lucky here pretty quickly. All right, so I have, I don't want SVG, I want PNG, okay. So here is an icon. I'm just gonna grab it and I'm gonna place it. This is a PNG, it's a, it's a uh, resolution dependent image. Notice if it gets really big, it doesn't look all that attractive. But in placing it, I can place it at a resolution that is gonna look good um, in most browsers. Because it's a PNG, there's a nice backdoor. Ollie Cordelli will go down in history as discovering this. No one on the Muse team realized it. But if you go into the Glow panel under Effects and you select a Glow color, we'll uh, do a beautiful shade of pink, and set the opacity to 100%, the blur to 250, so I'm maxing it out. It's looking really scary there. You can't quite tell, but it's got a pretty um, awful outer glow applied to it. If I click on inner glow, notice what just happened. It kind of magically has gone in and changed the color of that icon. 
such that I can easily go in and apply that. If I change my named color sets and decide I'm going to use a different color, it's really easy to go in and just make sure that color is consistent with the rest of the site and is easily adjusted. So advantage there. Disadvantage, it's a graphic. So uh, it's a little heavier to load. Um, it might load more slowly. Um, and it's resolution dependent, which means depending on the device I'm working on, if I'm on some retina display, high DPI uh, viewer, it may not look fantastic. But that's one way to go. Another one to go is to come on in and place SVG, which is Scalable Vector Graphic. So if I go back into that wildcard there and I try ICO uh, in my Dropbox folder, scroll on down. I think we saw this arrow in both ways, but I'm not going to try to find the same one. I want to be quick about it. Which means it'll take forever, I guarantee it. All right, we have this lovely bird icon. And I can place it on the canvas. Now, it is lovely in that I can make it really big. It may take a second, whoops, to render in the browser. Notice it's got to think a minute because it's grabbing a poster image from scalable vector graphic code. But it's really nice. It's quick. It's going to load quickly. And... Uh, it's there and in place. Now, if I decide I want to apply this particular color to this object, I have to work a little harder. So I'm going to go on in here, and I'm going to just lazily steal the hex value on this guy. So I'm going to copy it and hit cancel. If you want to colorize an icon like this, I can go into Memory Serves, the Assets panel, And go to this guy and edit the original. He's going to say, wow, you're in Adobe Illustrator SVG, which is the internal format we use, or Illustrator content. And it's going to open up that source application, the vector ed editing application. And I can come on in to that silly little bird sitting off here in the corner. Not sure why. Uh, where have you gone? But if I get on in on this object, and I can select at least some of the vectors. I'll be kind of funny and select just some of them. If I double click here, I can paste that hex value. Click OK. I know I'm scaring you guys left and right. <laughs> I think all the designers have lost, left the room. OK. I now have this nice purple bird. I can hit Save, swing back into Adobe Muse, and guess what? It's matched the colors. So was it as easy as using inline glow? It was not. If I want to change it every time, I need to go back to Illustrator and make that color change value. But the advantage is it's here. It's going to load easily. I can do lots of things with SVG. I can define it as background fills. Um, I can add them to slideshows. So lots of good advantages there. These are just graphic elements. Another world that's rather interesting has to do with um, creating icon fonts. And in the resources file here, if you scroll on down, I'm giving you some nice links, I think, to uh, good stuff. So there's a service called uh, Fontillo. And uh, I didn't include the link there, so let's go do that. F-O-N-T-I-L-L-O, -L -L -O, I think. No, not Jerry Fontello. Let's try this. Never Google or go somewhere you don't know where you're headed. Okay, this is an icon generator. It's magical. It's free, which makes it extra magical. But you can come on in here and select a series of fonts. I just did it merely an hour ago to prepare for this session. But you can come in and choose fonts that you'd like to use. Now, they're looking like a bunch of squares because it's working really hard to render this page. So I got a lot running on this machine all at once. Um, but these are a series of, and you see they're starting to fill in here, icon fonts. I went in, I'm not going to delay too much because I don't have much time. Um, we'll come back to this page for a moment. But I went in and selected 13 fonts that I wanted to work with. And I um, went in and you can even customize the names, which is really cool. Uh, here's the icons that I selected. So they've got these default names. They're pretty descriptive. But this is an icon set I thought that I'd use in my site design. And I saved it out. I called it PRC RESP. 
And um, next thing I want to do is actually go to that downloaded version of that font. So I think I put it in a folder here. I know. People are saying, Danny, A, eat lunch. B, do not drink coffee all morning long. Let's see, Fontello PRC responsive. And what I get is a series of stuff that if you don't know typography or the web, you're like, what the heck? Um, one thing that's important is there's a TTF. It's a true type font. When you're working with self-hosted fonts, that's what this will be, you're going to want to have a version of the font in your system folder so that Adobe Muse knows how to render it within the application. So first thing you'll do is go ahead and double click on that true type font and install it into your system. It says I've done this before, because maybe I have. I'm like, eh, go ahead, go for it. So it's added that font, I believe, into my world. Next thing I want to do, Muse tends to realize I've done that, but I may have to quit the app, let's see. If I pull that on file, no. If I come on into, let's say I want to work with this a little bit. I'm going to grab just a bit of text, get to my text drop down here, go to add. Actually, I don't even need to do it that way. And select nothing on the canvas. And I'm going to pull down on file two. Hmm, should have done it the other way. Oh, add and remove web fonts. I want to go to self-host it. I want to go ahead and browse to add fonts. I'm going to browse to the directory where I put those. Fontillo, PRC, responsive. I'm just going to select the folder level. Click on choose. Now, when I went to Fontillo, it saved out what's known as a WAF, an EOT, and an SVG. These are different font formats that are important for Android, iOS devices, web, safe, WAF is a web font format. These are what's necessary to host this font as part of my news project on the web. So I'm going to click OK saying I have the rights to license to work with this font. And if you're not sure, you should check the licensing for your typeface. So I'm going to then come on in and remind me that I need to meet any licensing requirements. If I use a font from Monotype, let's say fonts.com. They have restrictions about how those fonts are used and you want to make sure you're in compliance with that. But I've got it added there, my PRC responsive regular. So I'll click OK and it's now added to my web fonts menu. Kind of a long process there. Um, but let's say I want to work with that icon font. I'm going to go into my glyphs panel because it is a typeface that has no letters, right? It's just got images. I'm going to go ahead and try to find that guy. So let's give it some text to chew on first. So let's try here. Um, perhaps I want to integrate it just on top here. So I'll click in there, and I'm going to try to go to, see, I haven't been here in a little while. So go entire font. And in my text drop down here, I'm going to type P because we know it's a PRC responsive. There we go. And it doesn't look like much because there's not any typefaces in it. But notice when I look at the entire font set, I can see my typefaces. So I might go in and say that leaf looks really swell. And I can simply then treat it like a typeface. I can make the leaf a lot bigger. And I can come in and choose one of the colors that I'm using on this fabulous website design and apply it. So because this is a typeface, let's kind of review this a little bit. This guy is a PNG, it's image resolution dependent. It's easy to colorize as uh, an inline glow. This guy is a scalable vector object. It's kind of as lightweight as this icon font that I've just created. It's vector content. It will always scale to the resolution of the device that it's displaying on. It will load quickly, it's easy to work with. If you're willing to go a little bit further though, creating an icon font really allows you to have that available and work with it, colorize it very easily without having to go out to Illustrator. Last thing I want to point out about that, maybe, is Fontello also has this other really cool thing. So let's say I was working on this and um, I'm back in the select icons area. Look at this, custom icons. I can drag 
any custom SVG icon or SVG font here. That means that let's say I wanted to have all the icons you already saw, and I wanted to include this lovely bird as an SVG in my Fontello font so that I have it available. I can copy that or drag it over from probably the desktop where that SVG existed into this area, and when I save or download it, it'll treat it as one additional font. So any company logos that you work with, any custom, custom content that you want to include with your icon set can be included in this interface. I think it's terrific, and it's an amazing free service. Okay, I'm going to stop for a minute um, and just check and see how chat's going. Ali Portelli, as I mentioned, you are free to, uh, yeah, Valerie, I ignored the fact that MS could be Microsoft because I don't speak Microsoft, I'm sorry. It's just not in my language. Um, Ali, if there's anything that's come up, in chat or in the Q&A area, turn on your speaker and tell me because I got to keep going. I'm running out of time and I got a lot to cover. Yeah, totally, of course. Oh, hello. Good to hear hey. you. Lonely <laughs> talking in a room by myself. I know. Yeah, right, we can make some small talk. I'm going to close sure. Illustrator so my computer's not working quite so hard. I'll go back to my magical list. All right. We talked about icon font approaches. We're up to number three. Um, bullets and lists, let's take it just a little bit further. As I'm working, let's say I decide to come on in here, and I'm going to go ahead and close out the Glyphs panel, although I probably want it in a minute. Um, let's do a couple playful things. I'm going to go ahead and select my SVG element, and I'm going to copy it. I'm going to come to this text box, and let's say I wanted to do kind of a, uh, I think it's called a drop cap. I keep forgetting my brain a little bit today. Let's say I thought this bird would make a great drop cap for paragraphs separator bit here. I can come in and paste that guy. So let me explain what I did there real quickly. I'm going to come to the object. I'm going to copy it. So copy. So it's on the clipboard. Come to my text box here. Get right to the edge. And I'm going to go ahead and paste it in. Now once I've done that, depending on the display you're working with, which is incredibly confusing sometimes, um, there is something called a text wrap. The resolution I'm running with, it doesn't show the wrap here. Help me out, Ollie. Where's, which panel is text wrap in? Is it in text? Hmm. I feel like it's not. I haven't been here in a while. I think it's called wrap. Uh, it's right on the right side of the screen. If you, yeah, that's it. Oh, yeah. There you go. See? You're like, you're like in-app help. I need to have you all. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to select the object I want to wrap. Now, it is not going to flow around the beautiful arches of this bird. Um, we don't have that. But I can determine the method of wrapping that I do. Um, and I can see how close I want to get to that wrap. And because remember, we've got to do this on the web in code. So there are some limits to um, how much we do here. Let me try that again and set all these to zero, except for that side. Now you'll want to play, and things like the way your leading, your line height uh, changes will affect the wrap a bit, but that's kind of a nice technique. Um, let's go to bullets now. So I'm going to go in and say, uh, let's say one, two, three, four. Poor Ike Spikes. He's not getting much of a cameo today. If I wanted these to be a list, I can come in and select them. Notice in the control panel here, I can... Go ahead and enable a numbered list. Now, um, that's kind of interesting. It applied it to everything there. Let's see. I want it just here. Huh. I don't really want you to be a numbered list. All right. Maybe the way I've set this text out. Uh, but usually I can come on in. Let's try to just cheat this thing here. Make this guy go away. Yes. All right. We'll stick with those five. So that's a numbered list. I might like that. It's using the same font. If I don't like it, I can go into, uh, not bullet styles, but bullets. And we know I have a numbered style here. I can control how far it insets. So I may want it a little more flush to my text container. I can also determine how close the bullet is to my actual text content. Notice here I have this thing called auto. Hmm, what's that about? What that is about is it's going to automatically choose, um, I think, the size of my numbers. <laughs> I think I thought I was going to do something else. Hold on. 
All right. So that's choosing how large are those numbers in relationship to the object. Let's say instead of a number, I want to use an icon font. I'll go on in and in the drop down. Yeah, I can use numbering styles there. But I want to go in and switch it instead to a bullet. So I got these cute little bullets, but they're kind of boring. They're not amazing. And I'd rather do an amazing bullet. What I can do is choose, all right, have to slow down, for both numbers and bullets. You may like the number or bullet on a font and not want to use that font. You may want to use a different typeface for the text. Notice here auto is basically saying I'm going to rely on the numbers or the bullets built into this font. If I don't want to automatically rely on those numbers, I can switch to any other font that I have in my system. I'm going to choose the icon font. See how this is all building? Um, make sure I have this selected before I do it. I'm going to say PRC responsive, right? Now here comes the magic, maybe. <laughs> um, let's see. Just thinking a little bit. Hmm. All right. I am kind of forgetting myself. If I go to the glyphs panel, hmm. This is always tricky. It's been a little while since I've been here. Let's look at the drop down. Oh yeah, there's the magic. So I have these selected. The default bullet is here. I don't want to use that default bullet. I want to use my PRC responsive font. So I select it here, and then in this drop down, I'm going to select a new character. And I'm there in that PR responsive. There ain't no bullets, because remember I created this myself, but if I look at the entire font, I may decide that this airplane would be an amazing uh, bullet because we know I have shaky design skills today. I'll click OK and there you go. I have a lovely icon that I've defined um, that's from the web. As we know, I created it. It's light. It's beautiful. From there, I can come in and select this guy and readjust the spacing between my bullet and the website. So. Uh, there's the magic all rolled up together. Lastly, I think I can even come in, oh yeah, I can change its color just to make things even more exciting. So if I come on in here, uh, I'm going to pick that fashionable green again. Notice that the font color did not change, simply the icon. I know, we could do like seven jam sessions with the time we got going on here. Uh, glyphs are not supported, which is kind of funny. Shadow text we already talked about. Superscript, subscript, we've touched on it. So I may come in and say, your first and not the third friend. Now this is extra weird because remember I picked a font that has very low uh, ascender. Um, uh, it has a uh, old style numbers, so this may not be the best way to apply superscript because the numbers are already really small. <laughs> but I'm going to come in and select third and first, and go ahead and set those as subscripts. Uh, subscript uh, for your reference. If I were writing a technical paper, I could come in and select that one and make it a subscript and then create a footnote there just below. We are so on a roll and four minutes over, but I got a lot to cover. We talked about text wrap. Um, we talked about drop caps, kind of one and the same. Shadow text we already covered. Baseline alignment, you can read what I've written there. We don't have baseline alignment. That's pretty advanced typographic control. That says that if you have multiple columns of text, you want to line them up across so that visually everything seems to work. Well, when you have different typesetting, it's pretty hard to do. You could add a grid into your design canvas just as a guide to try to align across, um, but it's a complex idea we've talked about and haven't necessarily implemented. All right, people, with all of that said, I want to show you a little bit about the world of responsive and how responsive design and typography come together. So much beautiful stuff to show here. I'm going to pick a very simple example, and I'm going to copy this and just go to uh, just go to a new page. So, come on here, 
And uh, let's say I'm working in the world of responsive. And I paste, well, not enough, let's try that again. And grab this and this, copy it, swing over to page two and paste this in place. And um, I wanna do a couple typographic things. As I'm working, I wanna work with uh, a few different designs of breakpoints. So we're gonna, let's start this first guy at something like 1200. And I'm gonna set my min width to more like 1000. So I've got my first kind of breakpoint. Now for the text that I have here, just to start with, I'm gonna set the responsive width to none. This kind of makes life easy when you're trying to work with multiple breakpoints. This is part of my off-site homework in the past two and a half weeks, which is how to build out a responsive site without things breaking apart on you. So I got some text that's here, and we'll kind of dupe this out a little bit. And I'll select it all and center it there. Well, as I work, um, maybe I want this to be a fixed breakpoint. Let's leave it alone for now. Um, but I don't want my text to flow at all. I want them to kind of be standard. Uh, I'll come on in and just see, is there pinning applied here at all? There's not. I'm going to center this guy a little bit. And, you know, maybe I get to a point where things are starting to look a little crowded in my design. And I'll add another breakpoint. And perhaps for this guy, I want, you know, my text to be a good deal bigger. Move these guys down. Because maybe I'm on a tablet device now. I'm going to let this font be quite bigger. Maybe I'll move these guys over a little bit. What I'm doing is I'm using common text, but I'm setting the text attributes to be unique for each breakpoint. There is a very, not a big fan of this icon, it makes no sense to me, but um, there is an icon here on the left that allows you to control whether or not any text formatting that you do on different breakpoints is applied to the current breakpoint or all breakpoints. The default state is to allow you to format text uniquely per breakpoint. So maybe I think these are excellent. Um, in fact, I'm going to come on in, do this just a little bit more, make these a little wider, and uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to smoosh them in a little bit because I want to decide that when I get to a certain point, ah, no. <laughs> I need food. All right, I'm gonna come back in and make them a little wider. <laughs> I know, this is hilarious. What is the state of Danny today? But this time, because it's a fluid breakpoint, I'm gonna set it to have responsive width. So now as I drag a little bit, notice how my columns eh, are misbehaving. Let's just see. Select all these guys. Set you to be responsive in width. And yeah, so, oh, I know why. My min width there is set very large. Let's come on to this guy. I can just drag my min width, by the way, and bring it on in to about where my next break point's gonna fall. Now as I drag, see how it's flowing a little bit, and it'll get to a point that's rather crowded. I'm gonna go ahead and add one more break point, and zoom on out here. Grab these guys, and I'm just gonna stack them down. Ugh. Zoom out a little bit more, get them rather lined up, select everybody, and grabbing the right little triangle there, I'm going to grow these to be the full width for mobile, let's say a phone layout, and I'll reduce the gap between them there. Now, because I know I'm on the phone, A, I'm limited in space, but heck, you know, I need big fonts for phone. So I'm going to beef those up a little bit, grab those two bits of content, and bring it out. So if we wanted to go and take a look at this now, uh, I've got my very large standard font. Let's try actual size here. And as I press and drag and jump to different breakpoints, I'm getting sort of design that's specific to the devices that I'm working with. So in this last instance, I could come all the way down to uh, a smartphone and have things work well. All right. So hyper speed, hyper coffee there, you just caught how I would go through and do some typesetting. And that was all pretty straightforward. But let's say you're working and you're pulling your hair out and you decide that, um, let's see, um, 
trying to just think here. Let's say that you decide that for your paragraph style, you want to come in and set different attributes. So if I come into my text style here, and I really want it to indent on the left to be uh, 10 pixels. What did I do there? That's the top. So let's try the left. Try 30 pixels indent on the left, because I thought that was a good idea. I honestly have two options here. I can go to my paragraph style, and I can apply that change to my object if I want to. Kind of more appropriately, what I would like to do is um, just carry that change over to the other objects that I'm working with. Sorry, speaking in tongues. So um, let's just see. As I'm working, if you fiddle around, we know that I've gone in and said, make the text unique for each breakpoint. If I get to where I like the way this looks and I really want it to carry over to other designs, I can come in and say, you know what? Right click on that object, copy the text formatting to all the other breakpoints. So whatever I've just done, um, go ahead and apply that. Let's, let's do a better <laughs> use case. I'm gonna come on into this guy. And I'm going to go ahead, and I've got that shadow. I'm going to turn off the shadow. I can be like, you know, that shadow's ridiculous. I'm going to go to the rollover state and delete it, mouse down state and delete it. I just don't want it. And then you do a big heavy sigh because you have to come to this object, jump to the next breakpoint, apply it, jump to the next breakpoint and apply it. Instead, what you can do is wherever you are, whatever breakpoint you're on, when you right click, you can copy all of the text formatting, any attributes that you've made to that object, copy it to other breakpoints, and it's gonna go on in and apply that change without your having to copy and paste, which wouldn't work because you got multiple breakpoints and multiple instances, or creating new graphic styles or paragraph styles that you apply. So that's a nice hidden feature. I can also copy size and position to other breakpoints or a particular breakpoint just to leverage that. All right, that was a whole lot of information about typography, definitely a topic I really like. I'm going to stop a minute and um, check on my friend, Prince Ali, and see, are there any questions that have come up? Or if anybody wants to throw any questions into the chat right now, I'm happy to uh, answer them. As I mentioned, we're a little over time, uh, but if you're watching the recording, you are free to scrub around. Any other questions, anything else that came up that didn't cover what you thought we were going to cover? I'm going to go ahead and throw up a poll here and uh, see how we did. How many people like when Danny has no lunch and drinks too much coffee? You can put it in the chat. <laughs> Valerie says it was clear, so it's only in my own mind that I'm talking faster and faster. Um, is this poll showing? Yes, I'm going to launch the poll. <laughs> So feedback about this session, did it meet your requirements? Do we need to do more? Jam sessions are back on schedule. They're every other Wednesday at 1 p.m. for the more international type. If you say that this session falls short, you have to tell me in chat why it fell short. Else I'm gonna come find you and demand to know why. Um, and uh, if you have any other topics, <laughs> if you have any other topics that you wanna cover that we haven't been covering of late in jam sessions, Go ahead and throw it into the chat. I've got to invent something for uh, two weeks from now. So that's it, folks. I am going to stop the recording, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you so much for your time.